Hello, welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Ryan, Big Jim, and Gertie are with me as usual. We'll be having a look at Eddie Jones's England squad, chatting about some new laws World Rugby are bringing in, and having a chat with Bristol's former All Black John Foa after the Bears' tough start to the season. So make sure you're subscribed on Spotify and follow us on social media. How's your week been, boys? Andy Rowe, let's ask you first. Hit us, genuinely. Serotonin levels back, dopamine levels back to neutral. Um, to, to tell us from where you were last week to where you are now. I'll tell you what, last week was probably the darkest moment of my life. But I'm glad, I'm, it's good to be back. It's been a week on the couch recovering. Uh, got lots of cuddles from, from the missus, Jackie. She looked after me. Got Did you say sorry? Needed. Are you okay? Did you say not? sorry? That's all we need to say. Did you say I sorry? I didn't need to say sorry. I'm a good boy. <laughs> I was well behaved. I'm a stag do. And, you know, I got a lot of love. And um, and thank you, actually, to everyone that reached out to me on social media and asked me if I was okay and if I'd been to the dentist yet. And the answer is yes, I've fixed my teeth. Um, the stitches, the staples are out of my head. And I'm feeling good. I'm feeling, feeling like a... A normal person again. Well, that's good. good. I was down in London on Thursday, the London Coffee Festival. Oh, hello, how are you? And the lad that I was with, Harris, who's got a similar shaped nose to you, Andy Rowe, whatever that means, I don't really know. Um, large. But a lot, okay, you said it, large and long. Well, he was being asked every two seconds, how was Ibiza, how was Ibiza, because they thought you was him or he was you <laughs> or what whatever. Did, did he have a black eye as well? He just does what you do, Andy Rowan, just stood there and nodded. He didn't say anything. He just <laughs> was nodding and shaking like a nodding dog, like a shitting dog, <laughs> however you want to look at it. So, but it's good to hear, Andy Rowe, that you back up and talking because you couldn't string a sentence together last week. So from my perspective, you're out of the danger zone, is what mm. I'm saying. You're out of the danger zone. My fear, shock, and... Um, Basically, empathy has now gone for you. <laughs> Mate, yeah. it's a week later, so he, sh- he should be all good now. He said his apologies to his missus, or he said he hasn't. He's just got a load of cuddles. And you were back on the side of the pitch on the weekend for the URC, and you were dressed up for that as well, Jim. Oh, wow. my jacket. Oh, my jacket and boot combo. Andrew, <laughs> be honest and be straight with me right here, right now. Yes. Was it that bad or not? Because I genuinely put that jacket on, Big shout yeah. out to Bell staff. Looked in the mirror and thought, fucking smashed it. Absolutely <laughs> smashed it today. Out we go. I put the aftershave on, the spice bomb, and walked out the door feeling a million dollars. Next thing, the social. I can feel it vibrating in my pocket. Something's happening. <laughs> what have I said? Have I gone skibby? Have I done a James Haskell again? Like what he did. Something has happened. And then I realised... I'm getting absolutely buried for the jacket. That bad or not? Mate, um, well, first thing I'll ask is, did Beck see you walk out the house with that jacket on? Yes, but I didn't know whether she was laughing or crying. (laughs) Well, there's your first point. Um, She's probably laughing, going, yeah, Jim, you look amazing. Go out in that jacket. Because she knows you're a good-looking bloke, right? She knows you're like an alpha male. So if she sends you out the house looking with fancy dress on or you've been to the charity shop or whatever, she's like, well, that'll rain him back a bit, right? That'll make him wind his neck in a bit. And so she's the clever one. The jacket, the suede red, no, it, it's just not for me, Jim. I can let the boots slide. Like the, the flippers you had on your feet, the old biker boots. <laughs> I'll happily I'm let them bothered. slide. I'm not bothered that it's not for you. This is the thing. I don't wear the loafers when my feet are literally folding out the top of them. Like, do you know what I mean? Like they're swollen, like I've been on the plane for 50 hours. So I don't like it. It's like off you with all due respect. You you dress well in your own style. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like yeah. you, you dress expensive. You wear them Louis Bajons with the red bottoms, but are actually orange because they're a rip-off fake ones from Dubai. Your feet are folding out of the loafers, you know, your belt with that H buckle or it's whatever, it, which mate, is not about me. Yeah, but, about me I mean, but as, in, as in like, by you telling me it didn't look good, as in I'm thinking it doesn't bother me that much, but the 1,000 other interactions that I got <laughs> uh, is making me think, actually, maybe the T-shirt wasn't right or maybe <laughs> the boot combo <laughs> wasn't right. <laughs> I felt good anyway. Nonetheless, the first game of the URC, which I should say was absolutely amazing, 
for week one. Edinburgh weren't Edinburgh Scarlets wasn't the first game. It was uh, Zebra Lions, the big one, and then Glasgow Ulster. It wasn't about me, albeit it kind of was, uh, because it got the most interaction away from the pitch. But yeah, we won <coughs> the URC. Absolutely loved it. And England are back in camp, boys, uh, at the start of this week, out of the autumn test. What did you guys make of Eddie wielding the axe? The Vunapolis, gone. George Ford, gone. Jamie George, also gone. What did you make of that? Goody, are they gone? Are they gone, gone? Or is it a kind of kick up the backside. Jamie George, let's be honest, is a bloody weird call. I can kind of see Billy. To a degree, I can kind of see Mako as well. But Jamie George and Ford, big call as well. But Jamie yeah, George, uh, is it a kick up the arse? But why is it a kick up the arse? He's, uh, uh, man, just... The one I don't get, yeah, the one I don't get is Jamie George. Um, you know, it's, for me, you know, obviously Luke Cowan Dickey has kind of edged his way just in front over the last year. I think a lot of that has got to do with uh, Saracens playing the championship and then obviously the form of Jamie George and the England team as a whole to start off with in that Six Nations last year. Karen Dickey got himself ahead. On the Lions tour, Jamie George played pretty well, captain the Lions. He didn't make the Test match 23, which was a bit of a surprise, especially as the Test series developed. But yeah, I mean, you know, obviously Jamie Blamar played um, for England over the summer from Newcastle as a hooker and he's a decent player, but Jamie George not being picked, and all due respect, Sam Riley made his premiership debut off the bench last weekend for Quinns. And he's on the bench again this weekend for Quinns. Now, he's definitely going to be a good player in the future. I'm not bagging him as a player at all. He's about 12 years old. Um, Jamie George, I don't see what he's done wrong to not get picked in the squad. Um, Billy and Mako, I think, a different kettle of fish completely. Um, when you look at Billy, you've got... Sam Simmons and Alex Dombrandt as direct competition in the number eight jersey. And let's not forget he played Tom Curry there as well uh, last year. For me, you know, Billy's is a rocket. You've got to perform for Saracens. You've not performed well for England for the last six, nine, 12 months kind of thing. Um, so that's a rocket. Same for Mako a little bit, maybe, um, you know, off the back of the scrum not going overly well at times in the Lions series. Um, and the fact that Ellis Genge and Joe Marler, bringing Joe Marler back into the mix changes things for Mako because, you know, Marler's in there on form, but also his scrummaging is world-class. So if he's going to start at loose head, you then need a point of difference off the bench, which obviously is, um, you know, Ellis Genge, the baby rhino coming on. Um, and, and so you can see that as a rocket. The George Ford one, again, similar. Marcus Smith been, has been outstanding. George Ford hasn't played that well for England over the last sort of six months. Um, and it's a rocket for him as well. And, and my goodness, he, you know, he started the season in excellent form. So for me, you know, the door's never closed. But Eddie has started to listen to our podcast, as he said. Uh, he started listening to people in the media. And he's actually now flipped his, his kind of decision making. You go back 18 months, he was like, premiership form doesn't really matter. You know, it's not relevant to international class and international form. Now he's starting to change it because he's actually picking form players on premiership form at the back end of the season in terms of the, the summer series. And now, you know, he's picked some exciting youngsters that have, are performing on the premiership stage week in, week out. And it's, it's great to see. Such a strange shift, though, do you not think, around the mentality of Eddie? I suppose the whole organisation, really. It's hard because we don't want really- to go too hard on it and too hard on him you know fuck it let's go hard on him because he's earning a, a significant amount of money and he's meant he's, he's meant to be judged by people doing podcasts like us massive change of guard every single season of coaches flip-flops between sticking with players not sticking with players and I like the loyalty that he showed he showed after the 2015 World Cup and he obviously phased some of the guys out off the back of that and stuck with them and gave them, you know, guys like Dylan, guys like Rob Shaw, gave them the opportunity to kind of go out their own way as opposed to just dropping them straight. And then the Six Nations as well. And it was there to all see, and it was different because it was a COVID year. He wasn't picking on form. It almost seemed like he had, had a bee in his bonnet, bonnet about Sam Simmons and the media absolutely loving him. Sam Simmons goes on the Lions tour and then he almost does what everyone kind of wanted him to do, but he's waited to do it almost out of like, just despite the media, I don't know. Maybe I'm just seeing things, but yeah. it's just a weird. I mean, it's just a weird setup, is it? Because and then like now, it's like, is now the right time to to drop, you know, 
George Ford with Marcus Smith, maybe. Like you just said about the hookers, you know, no disrespect to them. It's obviously unbelievable. You know, Jamie George, he, he can go to the next World Cup easily. But then on the flip side, you've got Young Z, who, again, we love Young Z. We're at Leicester with Young Z. He's got 100-odd caps or whatever. You're not really looking to the future, though, are you, with having Young Z in there? Not saying that Young Z shouldn't be in there, but it's almost just like a bit of a, a mishmash. Well, yeah, I think Young Z is different. Because he can go to the next World Cup. Um, and because he's had that stranglehold on the jersey, what Eddie hasn't done is really embed someone else in as a direct competition. Danny Kerr played against Japan pre-World Cup two years ago, three years ago probably now, hasn't been seen since. Um, and, you know, I know they had a fallen out. I know Danny Kerr sort of put it to Eddie Jones a little bit around selection and he just didn't pick him again. So if you cast off Ben Young's now, um, for me, that's not the right thing to do because you're losing all that experience where actually you haven't blooded someone else. There's not, you know, in the prop position you've got, Joe Marler with a whole load of caps and Ellis Genge who's got a whole load of caps. So if you lose Mako, that's not that bad. Whereas if you take out Ben Youngs, you've got Dan Robson, Rafi Quirk and um, Harry Randall in there. So I'll say that again. You've got Dan Robson, Rafi Quirk and Harry Randall as the other three scrum halves to Ben Youngs in the squad. None of them have got much experience at international level. So you can't just not pick Ben Youngs if that makes sense. Um, and Youngs is class. You know, he, he hasn't played that well. But because there aren't that many other options in terms of experience and nine is so pivotal um, in, in terms of running the game, you need Ben Young's experience in there and you need to actually, maybe maybe he doesn't pick Ben Young's this autumn and just gives Dan Robson the nine jersey and then has Rafi Quirk or Harry Randall on the bench as a point of difference to give him experience. But to be fair to Eddie Jones, he ain't doing it now. Two years out from the World Cup, he's not doing it at all, is he? Um, and, you know, he's come out and he said that he's not extending his contract. England have said we're going to, you know, Eddie Jones' tenure will come to the end at the end of the World Cup. Um, so now if he's going to make changes, he's going to do, he's not planning for anything else except for the World Cup. So he can blood as many of these young players and we might get a bit of pain along the way um, with, you know, a lot of these inexperienced players playing. Um, but ultimately he can always bring those boys back in as and when he needs because he needs to learn about the, the other players in these positions now to, to go forward to win the World Cup, hopefully. What have you guys made of the new contact training guidelines that have come out this week? Oh, it's all going to be changed in two years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, inter- I mean it's interesting, isn't it? Because you've got 15 minutes of full on bone on bone. And I'd say there aren't many clubs that do much more than that, anyway, is there? I don't know. I don't know what. I mean, it's probably a question I probably should ask the coaches. I mean, 15 minutes a week, which they're planning on changing. In 2023, I don't know why they don't do it now. I don't know what the contact situation is actually in clubs. It's not a question that I've asked. I just presumed it was still full noise um, every Wednesday <laughs> or Thursday. You know, Saracens in my last year, they were very limited in contact, bone on bone. You know, what they used to do was fill the field though with 30 shields. <laughs> so you're really, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Goody. I could hit a man on a shield. If I was holding the shield, <laughs> right, and someone ran very into boys. me, apart from Maro Toji, he sat me down um, before his first start in the European Cup. He ran straight over me on the bag. I wasn't expecting him to be that powerful. I'll tell you what, though, I could hold a bloody tackle shield and absolutely obliterate people. Anyway, it's not well, about you, I, Well, it is about you. I'll tell you why you'd be able to do that, because you're the 100% the sort of player that wasn't in the starting team that would just go around Judas and boys with a tackle shield, wouldn't you? So you'd be carrying it. A boy's looking at the ball, coming into contact. You float in from the blo- his blind side and just buried his ribs. And, but That's the thing is as well, so you used to hold the bag and if someone was running really hard, you'd go, yandale, yandale, and you'd, pull, <laughs> you'd literally just not stood behind the bag. You'd just hold it to the side. So they'll come flying at 100 miles an hour, an hour at you. And literally, you're not behind the bag. <laughs> <laughs> so they just go flying through. So anyway, you had to be there, and not many people did it, but I was one of the guys that did it on the back. But anyway, that is obviously not, doesn't account for bone on bone. So that doesn't account for the 15 minutes of contact. And I'm right in saying, no, Goody? No, because that, that's control contact, where. Yeah. So effectively, they've broken it down into three parameters, haven't they? So full on bone on bone, probably 15 on 15 or 15 on 20, whatever you want to call it. Because um, I know some teams do that, they defend with 20 people. Good luck attacking against that, break the barrier stuff. That's 15 minutes. Um, then you go into uh, sort of control contact, which is gym, your bags, um, you know, maybe boys suited up as well. That's 40 minutes a week. 
and then the set piece, live scrums, live malls, live till the cows come home, Jim. You know, all that stuff is 30 minutes in a in a week. So I actually don't, you know, the big question for me is why haven't they just done it now? If you're talking about player welfare, why are we waiting for, t- for two years to worry about that's it? that's what we... they do at the top end of the game. They, <laughs> yes, that sits around the table, absolute zeppers. Yeah. Yeah. Genuinely. So you've got you've got that coming in to you. Just put it in now. That would be our kind of advice. And secondly, I think a lot of clubs would be doing that anyway. I think back to the back end of my career, when I avoided contact like the plague at training and in the game. But that's probably about right, isn't it? When you break it all down, backs backs never did any contact, right? Um, you'd do the odd bit of rocking, but that'd be come under control contact. Um, you do. You only ever worry about that defensive session where you're going full on bone on bone and you've got a load of you've got 15 lads who are in the opposition team who are absolutely raging they're not starting this weekend and then you've got 15 lads in the starting team probably 10 of them are ready to go bone and bone the other five of us are like geez i just need to get through this session and avoid contact if we can because i'm you know i've got no interest in it in in the training week but you have to do it sometimes so yeah it's the balance is right just bring it in now otherwise what's the point what's the point waiting two years who knows what the world's gonna look like in two years we could have another pandemic oh don't say that <laughs> well, the world's looking a little bit different at the top of the Premiership table. We're at the bottom. Bristol and Exeter lost a game to open their season. Do you guys see any big problems there? Oh, well, I mean, again, for all the haters who were hating on me, saying that Bristol and Exeter weren't top four, you're probably right because it's only two games in. <laughs> um, where do we start? Let's start with Exeter, Andrew. They're missing a lot of players. Uh, this is the thing, and you you might be able to you might be in a really good place to answer this question, Jim. So go back. Actually, you won't because it was you'd retired. But you go back to I go back to Leicester days when Leicester had seven or eight Lions players. Saracens when they had seven. I don't know the exact numbers, but they had seven Lions players in 2015. Sorry, not 2015 with it. So in 2017, um, you know, this year Exeter had a big lump of Lions players, didn't they? That haven't got them. So there is a knock-on effect without a shadow of a doubt. They're missing the likes of Johnny Hill. Sam Simmons, um, Luke Cowan-Dickey, Luke Cowan-Dickey, yeah, Stuart Hogg. You know, you, there's four British and Irish Lions players there that you put them in a club team. All of a sudden, it's nearly a third of your starting team. You know, Johnny Gray as well hasn't played. I know he didn't go on the Lions tour, but you know they're missing a, a third of their top top stars. So yes, they're going to struggle at times, um, and it's very similar probably to when all these boys are away for the Autumn Internationals and the Six Nations. And the fact that they didn't have a massive pre-season in terms of games, they had back-to-back seasons. You can make an excuse for Exeter about not being quite at it um, because of the quality they're missing. And they will bounce back. Um, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Yes, they're, they've played two, lost two. Uh, but the class they've got in that squad, they will they will come back. They're also adjusting. You see the way they're playing. They're picking, they haven't really changed the way they're playing much, but their drive with the boys they've got playing at the minute, their driving line out isn't as strong um, and teams are defending that. I thought Northampton did it unbelievably well at the weekend. Yeah, um, their four was really good in, in all yeah. that, in the line out drive and the picking goo. I'd be more worried if I was a Bristol fan than an extra fan because Bristol, I mean, they had their pants properly pulled Where's Sammy? That's I mean, it. Like, yeah. Literally, Sammy, where are you? Are you selling Fiji? Are you coming home? Please come home. How much do you want? <laughs> but That'll it's easy to sit here isn't it I mean yeah. it, it will like the thing is like we love Bristol you know we're going to speak to John Afoa. Um we've had Pat Lamb on you know we've spoken to loads of guys from Bristol before we love them they've changed the premiership by the way that they've played and some of the signs they've made you know last season and we'll ask John you know were they reliant on Semi because let's be honest he, he was the best player in the premiership probably probably by a country mile yeah. Do you know what I mean in terms of what he could do? Um, they're all at attack. That's what Bristol's do. They got found out in that semi-final again, in that unbelievable game against Quinns. They were 28 nil up and, and, and Quinns come back to win that in the best comeback we've ever seen. Um, I don't know. Would I be worried if I was Bristol's? Where's Semi? And then, hey, when Semi's back, let me know. If he doesn't come back, then I'll give you my answer. But um, look, again, you know, they're a fantastic team, but it's just opened the Premiership right up and that makes me happy. We'll unpack each game that uh, Exeter and uh, Bristol were in, but let's, let's have a look first at 
at Exeter's game. Northampton, how impressed were you guys with, with the Saints' performance? Yeah, very. Good you mentioned it there. The forward pack fronted up, and that's what you've got to do against Exeter. I thought they were physical in that area. From one to eight, there's no point me naming everyone in that in that pack. I thought North Northampton looked like they've got a bit of an identity. You know, Furbanks kick at the end. Um, in terms of the tough kick, and I, I like the way that Northampton play. They've got a good English contingent at the club, and off the back of you, you don't want to get too carried away. It, it is hard because you watch that game, and it's it's not the exit scene that you used to seeing. So it's mm. hard trying to judge where Northampton are. They, they, Northampton beat Gloucester in the first game of the season. Uh, Goody thinks that Gloucester aren't that great. I thought they were much better against Leicester, but. I mean, that was it. They fronted up up front and they've got some exciting backs and Furbank took a good kick and Exeter kind of stole it at the end. Dingwall and Matt Proctor in the centres at the weekend were quality. Proctor, since he's come to the Premiership, every time he's been fit, um, I think he's a ridiculously good player. Um, he scored a, a try at the weekend where he's stepped through Joe Simmons and accelerated through. I mean, Saints, uh, consistency's always been their issue, hasn't it? So, you know, when the sun's out, they love to chuck it around. Their offloading game's great. They've married that up now with, you know, a bit of grunt up front, which was good. Uh, they've obviously got Courtney Laws to come back in as well. Um, and they've got some good, young, exciting players. Furbank's playing with a lot of confidence. Dingwall is an outstanding player. Um, I did not who, know he could hit a man like that, yeah, Andrew. He can, he can boom. The boy can boom, mate. Um, so, yeah, things are good. And, and I'm really impressed with James Grayson. They've got Dan Bigger to come back in at 10 as well. Of who course. I know is ch- chomping at the bit to play. Um, and you know, he's been a quality signing in the Premiership, earns his coin. He's well paid, but he plays a hell of a lot of rugby. But James Grayson, again, made a hell of a break at the weekend, was in a bit of trouble, used his footwork, came around by the ruck and broke through. Again, more experience. He's getting better and better. So Saints are in a good place. Do you guys reckon Leicester are the real deal? after the, Because they're top of the table now after the bonus point win at Gloucester on Friday night, don't they? I don't want to yes. get too carried away with it, but they're going to win it, hands down. Andrew? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. They, they look good, didn't they? Um, you know, everything they put the sort of stepping stones in last year with, you know, going back to tight, going back to a Leicester way, a big pack, driving malls, physicality, all the things that Leicester success has been built over the years. They went back to that last year. They're now adding in layers of attack. And if you've got Kevin Sinfield anywhere near your, your organisation, it just breeds winning, doesn't he? So... Confidence is, you know, and it does take, a, you think back to the dark days at Leicester, it takes a long time to come through that, knowing and getting a few wins and starting to believe and have confidence. And they've got it now, haven't they? Um, they were really good at times um, against Gloucester on Friday night. Gloucester were much improved um, and it was a hell of a ding dong. But Leicester's power game was great. Nick Dolly mixture at hooker, what a signing he's been. You know, again, Champo player that's come through. He's taken his chance. Montoya is away with Argentina. Obviously, uh, Tom Young's is out injured as well. So, yeah, I mean, they've got some grunt about them and they've got some class now in attack. You know, I like Dan Kelly, how he's not been picked for England as well after playing pretty well in the summer. Um, you know, the balance they've got in attack. Mandolo, I mean, I don't want to say he looks hungry because he's lost a load of weight. He might be hungry. Jeez, he's playing one as well. Yeah, well, like, I think he is hungry because you've just nailed it on the head there, Andrew, <laughs> and there's no better man to talk about weight. He looks lean. Yeah. Doesn't he? Like yeah. that break that that break that he made from his own half. Um he's but I love the way that Leicester are playing. And I think there is an element of bias. I not don't think I know. I know there is. But I want him to do well. I really do. And who, who, who did G, you want to win on who did you want to win on Friday night? Gloucester or Leicester then? Put you on the spot. Hand, hand on heart? Yeah. Leicester. Mate, why are you being horrible to Gloucester for saying they're going no, to finish no. bottom? Look, you know, <laughs> Ravo, Ravo's arm, 50, uh, against Deeks, my two best mates, Deeks coaching Leicester. But for me, Gloucester aren't in contention for the top four, whereas Leicester are. And that's why I didn't want Gloucester to get hosed. They didn't. I think they, they showed real resilience. They could have, yeah. you know, lay down and took it. But at home in front of the shed, it's a very different looking Leicester team so and I, I say that so like if you Gloucester like Skibbs mentioned it at the end he's like you know they fronted up you know they, they, they were heroic quote unquote and they were and you know what yeah. they look really good but Leicester have just got something about them now and were you hosting Wasps at the last weekend against Bristol as well Goody? 
mate. The Andy Good suite was round full, 550 covers, biggest in the Premiership, I'm, so I'm told. Um, so and you're doing what and Leicester now? Mate, I'm just a legend of both clubs, mate. What can you say? You know, no, I'm in you've demand. just got huge overheads at home. That's why. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's got overhang. A huge overhang, overhang or overhead. Overhang. Sorry. Overhang. <laughs> I don't know what Pablo's belly looks like, but potentially. <laughs> I'll be honest. I didn't put Wasps in the top four, as we know on here. Um, I didn't think they'd do it this year. And how wrong was I after round one? Because their performance, and we've always known that they can be decent ball in hand, right? They've got attacking flair. They're missing quite a few big-time players as well at the minute. They can score tries, Wasps, but they leak a hell of a lot. I think Wasps conceded the most amount of points in the Premiership last year, bar any team. I'm um, going to jump in, but their defence against an attacking team. There we go. Yeah, a good, a good friend of mine, Matty Everard, has taken over the defensive coaching duties. Um, Costello, Ian Costello's left uh, and gone back to Ireland. Matty Everard's been sort of pushed up from skills and, and breakdown to defensive coach and he was outstanding he's got John Mitchell to lean on I think that experience of John Mitchell will really help a young coaching group because we know we've got Richard Blaise Bance as well as the forwards coach um, and John Mitchell's doing the attack uh, and obviously Lee Blackett is you know DOR head coach so listen the defence was huge you, know, you score 44 points and restrict Bristol to eight and you're thinking fuck they've had a great day in attack but it was built on the foundations of graft and defence they've made some astute signings as well from the championship and I'll speak to Joe Launchbury um, in the corporate hospitality and he said a lot of these signings that Lee Blackett's made from the Champo um, won't necessarily put bombs on seats in the stadium as in big names but they will shock a lot of people with the quality of their signs so Ali Cosdale um, yeah I mean Cosdale he, he, technically he was playing the champo, wasn't he? Because he was with uh, Saracens. But what a debut he had. Um, I watched him at Saris Goody and I was like, this lad's going to play for England. And yeah. he, he, I think he got a few injuries off the back of it. He's one of the most gifted players, young lads I've seen coming through. So the fact that he scored a couple at the weekend, he is rapido, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Like balanced, yeah. like a balanced rapido and strong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's class. Mate, he was good. And I think, you know, he sit there and you actually think, so he... he did he get the injuries off the back of you saying he's going to play for England? Is that what you just said? Who knows? I can't make it's too long ago. It's four years. What's happened <laughs> in that time? Could be yeah. five years. And, and this is the thing, you know, he's a great sign at fullback. Youngster who, okay, so at Saracens and Alex Goob was there and Elliot Daly's there and Liam Williams was there previously. So perhaps he didn't get the look in that he, he, he would have got another club. So he's come to Wasps and he, he started on fire. Robin Hislop at Luso Prop as well. Not many people would have heard of him. Um, you know, he's come in and done exceptionally well. Scott and Dan, dad. Yeah, yeah. Hell of a hairdo on him. Might need to sort that out. But uh, Dan Frost as well came off the bench at Hooker, um, scored the bonus point try as well. Again, just a player that not many people know about. So Wasps have got... Just ice cold. He's just ice cold, that lad, isn't he? He, he is, mate. He you is. see, because um, like, if he's called Frost and, it's like, and he plays well, you can put him on there ice. There you go. Yeah, there you go, Joe. Yeah. There yeah, you go. Frost, so, yeah, Wasps, Wasps are good. You know, Fekitoa, Fekitoa nail has um, dislocated his shoulder, which is bad news. Oh, because um, he was playing absolutely out of his skin at the time. But and they they will miss him because he's a real sort of go-to man in in, in the centres for physicality. Um, but yeah, listen, it's a great start for Wasp, but it's just a start, isn't it? Well, speaking of the Bears, we're going to have a chat now with former All Black and current Bristol prop and scrum coach John Afar. How are you, mate? Oh, good, my brother. How's things? Good, good. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, uh, John. Uh, We've been trying to get you on for, it could be six years, back when you were in your early 30s, we were uh, trying to get you on. But when I was like, sort of relevant, but not now. Like. <laughs> no, you are. You're going to be a Hall of Famer. So that's why we desperately wanted to get you on. Uh, we were just actually saying about Bristol season, we can maybe go into a bit more depth. I think I quote unquote said, they need two men. They need Semi back and they need John Afoa back. I, I, I'm sure I said that. Where are you? What's happening? Are you, uh, well, firstly, let's, let's get the headline news. Where's Semi? And then we can come on to you. I tell you what, he's like floating around. He's just doing his bits. Like he doesn't train at the best of times. So like every day, every week, like he's doing like some jogging or he's doing some kind of training. And it's like, oh, he must be back because he's he's training and you just don't see him. Uh, I'm pretty sure he rocked into the meeting like five minutes late today and nobody says tickly boo. It's just like... I bet they don't. I bet <laughs> they don't. <laughs> it's it's just like... Has this motherfucker just walked in like five minutes from the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> Fiji time, mate. Fiji oh, he time. He just sits down and says, carry on. So it's all good. 
And what about you, John? Are you close to being back? I mean, so, uh, so is, 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 is Semi going to be back soon and yourself? Yeah, yeah. At the same time? The same time. So, like, hopefully two more weeks. Uh, I fractured my face, like, in an in internal game, which always makes sense, you know what I mean? When you're trying mm. to smoke some of your teammates and yeah. you crack, crack your eye socket in two different places. Oh. But one of those things, so uh, easy enough. Couple of, uh, hopefully back, sort of, we got Quinns and then maybe Newcastle. So that'll be the key for me. Lovely, mate. Hi. I mean, a bit of advice, 38 years of age, what are you smoking for and training for? Just keep it for the weekend and get the Superman out again. Oh, no, it's that's the key. Like, it's coming to that time of the year. Like, I'm trying to roll, like, roll the cart one more year, so I've got to like, start doing something at training. Like, I can't just stand on the sideline blowing my whistle and ask for another year, so i got to get involved. You're obviously still playing as well, and yeah, everyone yeah. loves seeing you on the field. You know, you, you do it with a smile on your face, but how has the transition gone into coaching, as, uh, you know, especially with the injury? Yeah, it's been actually uh, a good insight as in like sort of the preseason help the planning of all like what we're doing content wise. You know, the scrum is like obviously a big part of the game, but it absolutely gets the ass end of like time in the week. Like <laughs> no one's giving the scrum an hour of training. Like we get like maybe five minutes here, five minutes here. So that's it. So uh, it's been good. Like have our planning sessions and not being available for the first couple of games. It gives me like an insight of how it's actually run. So, like, hopefully I can stay fit and play, but if there's any other games where I'm not playing, I can sort of step in and do that role, you know, all mic'd up, got the water, sort of got the whole sort of timings of everything. So, it's been good. Um, how is the mood? Uh, and I say that, you know, with some context, it's you know, the second week in, an amazing season last year, but there seems to be a high expectation externally on Bristol. Um, some ridiculous person in the media said that you might not make the top four this season. I don't know who it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jim, uh, Jim Hamilton. Then, Jim so, Hamilton. No, but, but what's it like? A bit of a on... stretch saying the media, like it's just some yeah. rogue guy off account. Like, <laughs> oh, no, exactly. <laughs> very true. Very true. It's an absolute idiot. But what is the mood like? Do you feel there's a bit of pressure on this Bristol team now? The training venue, a settled squad, some world class players in this new season. Do you feel there's a bit, a bit more pressure? Yeah, of course there is. Like expectations now, like are given from what we've done the last few years, and and again, I think it's a good test for boys because um, you know the first couple of years, like no one expected anything, and just going back, I think the last three years we've all either won the first game, then lost the second game, or we've won lost the first game, won the second game. So we haven't lost the the first two openers since we've been back in the prem. So. And you know it's a tough competition. There's plenty of games, but you don't want to leave yourself too much work to do either because, you know, wins are hard to come by. So I think in that sense, guys know there's, you know, some added pressure to make sure we start getting things done quickly. But again, there's no point absolutely throwing the, the playbook out the window and just like running for the hill for it. Well, it's interesting that you talk about throwing the playbook out the window. Your playbook is just to play from anywhere a lot of the time. And we've seen some pragmatism at times as well. But Let's go back to the game on 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 Saturday at Wasps and forty four eight probably doesn't do uh, you know the scoreline much justice. I know Wasps got a couple of tries towards the the end to really take yourselves away from it, but it was a lot of your own errors, wasn't it? So handling errors, turnovers, and discipline are they quick fixes for the boys? You think they would be, you know what I mean, and that's what I mean. Sometimes you think, oh no, that's an easy fix, but sometimes it isn't because you know guys are seeing different pictures or they're thinking different things, and then you get that lack of uh, alignment. Uh, then that's I mean guys are overthinking and I think we had like over 20 turnovers the last two games and you know a game's about boarding pressure and then we haven't been able to do that and then obviously we fall behind you try and chase the game and then you, even more errors happen so um, you know and it goes around in circles where sometimes those passes stick those kicks come off sometimes they don't so you know we just got to make sure we're in that high percentage of players are going to come off and we can board pressure so we can use the likes of our you know, strike power in the back line or in our loose forwards. And how's Pat been with everything? We've had Pat on. We're huge fans of him on here. Love the way he talks about the game. You know, he's engaging. Um, he's open. How's he been with things? Obviously, last week was a huge week. Huge week for him. Well, he could have been signed a few weeks before and in signing his new contracts is what I'm trying to say. But yeah. like, how, has he, how has he been about things? Because naturally, there'll be a, a spotlight on him now. You know, yeah. again, with everything that's happened, the signs he's got, the new training ground, the fact that he signed a ridiculous deal. But how is he with things? Like, is he quite pragmatic about things as well? Or is he yeah. rearing a bit of old schoolness about kind of, I'm sure, what's inside him and probably wants to say a few things? Oh, yeah. You, you know, Pat, you know, he's a big man. And 
uh, when he gets angry, he gets even bigger. You know what I mean? Somehow, like his stature goes up, like the thing's brow goes up. And you just <laughs> you, you take another step back because you don't want to like be in that sort of circle. But the one good thing of Pat, with Pat's Pat, and the last three years or the four years that everyone's been there, we could win by fifty, lose by fifty, draw. He's the same on the Monday, angry and wanted more points on the board. So it doesn't really matter. So uh, in that sort of case, it's good for the guys because they know that he's never going to actually go off the rock or lose his stuff if we're winning or we're losing. Um, so then you get, a, you get a good idea of, of who he just wants, you know, fix his solutions and move on to the next game. While we're on this point, it's just kind of reared its head again. Talking about angry, the end of last season, when Pat and Borth was going at it, you were in between. I know we're going over old ground here, but I've, I've, it's just come to my mind. Uh, I loved it, by the way. You've come on, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how many cigarettes if you did, if you did smoke a couple on the bench. <laughs> You've come. I don't know any other man that could have sat there for as long as you did and come on and absolutely hose them. I mean, just tell us about what happened oh. in that situation because it's just thought provoked myself thinking about anger management. Yeah. It was, it was a crazy uh, sort of five minutes, 10 minutes there, like the whirlwind and the whole sort of like on the bench, the refs are coming along. So obviously I'm just sat there. I'm just like, what what the shit, man? Like what is happening? Because I'm getting like, I think if someone's going to throw a bottle at me soon enough, I don't get up and start moving. So that was all that. <laughs> but Borthos is just telling you to go on, isn't he? Like, yeah, he, like he's a mess saying, get him on. He can go on. Yeah, and like, it was all a bit on. strange. Like they all like saying, go on and all this kind of stuff. But the worst thing, I did feel bad, um, and it is sort of my fault at the end. The scrum was a scrum, whatever happened. And then, what's his name? Wiggleworth was there. And I, it was just because he is the first guy I've seen, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I've just yelled in his face, like, giving it, <laughs> like, for, like, <laughs> 10 seconds. And that was okay, but then for some reason, I've, like, shoulder barge him when I walked off too, and he did not like that. No, I'm sure that's he didn't. Like, <laughs> that's when he's, like, absolutely ragged on me to the ground, and I was just like, well, I sort of deserve this. I'll just lie here and take it. And he's like half yelling in my face, if this, 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 and this. Um, so, yeah. Granddad on granddad. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was an age off, wasn't there? I'm Nobody wanted you. to throw a punch because like Blake Frost Matthew got arthritis in her hand. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she had her wrists. The only thing I was disappointed in is when you did come back on, you didn't do the Superman coming back on the field. That's just got to be your trademark now, isn't it? He didn't know, though. He didn't back himself to know that he was going to absolutely <laughs> oh, hose them in yeah, the scrum. He did, knew he'd do it again. I heard he the whistle. It's either or, isn't it? I was just like, what's going on here? The fight's broken out. I've sort of like rolled away and just walked towards the post while I was still going because I was just like, I'm too old for that. I just <laughs> no, let Big Nate like throw boys yeah. around. Surely Pat would beat Borthers in a fight, though. Not that it's about that, but like, I'm walking <laughs> away... I forget the rugby. I'm walking away thinking, if, if that kicked off, IMO, I'm thinking Pat Lamb eat, eats him for Christmas dinner and Halloween yeah. dinner or whatever as well. But you see Borthers' face, like he's taken a few punches, so he knows how yeah. to like... He can wear a couple. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, can. He, yeah, yeah, he can. Very he true. He might come alive in the like ninth, tenth when like, you know, pets dust. Uh, talking about rivalries, uh, massive game this weekend for obvious reasons in terms of where you are in the premiership after two rounds, but also Bath, your nearest and dearest rivals, a lot of history there. Do you boys feel that, that sort of new breed of Bristol player? Um, do you still feel that rivalry or is it something that, you know, a lot of other people make noise around? No, I think it's there, you know what I mean? And it is a big rival for like Bath and, and Bristol and you don't have to be from sort of the either town to sort of know the history of it. And then, you know, for me, you can just use other examples like my rivalry when I was back in New Zealand or when I was at Gloucester and Bath rival. So you know what a rival feels like and you know what kind of week it's going to be like and you know what that kind of game is going to be where the intensity is high and there could be a niggle at the breakdown, you know, so you just know that's going to be there. So it makes the game challenging but also fun and enjoyable and normally the games that you sort of remember the most when you sort of finish up. So I've been told. All right, Joel. Thank you very much for coming on the show, mate. And best of luck getting back from that injury and getting back on the field. No worries. Cheers, lads. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers keep John. Keep Superman going, Johnny. Yeah. Tell Sammy I was asking for him. Cheers, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Top, Top lad. lad. Yeah, he is. He is. He plays a smile on his face, doesn't he? And he's fair play. Still going at 38. How old are you when you retired, Jim? Age. Well, he's the same age as me. I was 34. And I was absolutely... I mean... I've said it a million times. If I was a horse, put me down three times over is all I'm saying. 
I mean, he, he was awesome last season. Well, we just yeah. we spoke about it. The, yeah. the scrum at Leicester, uh, just stuck on the bench. <laughs> he comes on and does that. Uh, yeah. No, quality bloke. We love Bristol's. Um, has he convinced me not finishing the top four? Yeah, let's just say he has. Yeah, Semi's yeah. back. Semi's back in a couple back. of weeks. Well, let's round up the rest of the Premiership action. Then London Irish came back from 17 points down at half time to draw the sale. What does that tell us about those two sides? Because they, uh, Paddy Jackson had a kick to win it as well, didn't he? Hit the post he did. 57 metres. Yeah, down. mate. I, when kick. he's looking at it, it was out of a kick. When he's they've been given the penalty, he couldn't decide. He's like, you know, do I go for it? Have I got it in me? And then eventually he convinced himself. And oh my God, the strike on it, it was from 57 metres. He could have cleared the posts. Had it not hit the post, he could have cleared the crossbar by another 10 metres. He could have gone back even further. But um, yeah, listen, London Irish, first half, sale were all over them. AJ McGinty, and here's a big difference. AJ McGinty, as a 10, I've said it on here before, he is a quality operator. Um, and he was pulling strings like you wouldn't believe. He was using Manu, they were on the front foot and AJ was on fire. He gets injured from what I thought was a very dubious tackle. Um, and they only looked at Coleman for the kind of shoulder charge, which he got a yellow card for. But for me, it was a tip. Um, he's obviously landed on the point of his shoulder and popped his kind of AC or SC joint, whichever one it was. Um, and it was a tip from Van der Merwe, I thought, that should have been looked at better and perhaps... Was more there was more in it. You could have binned him or even sent him off. Um, and he, he's gone off injured, and that was a big turning point. When Sale was so dominant, AJ comes off, they lose their heads a bit. Um, I think some of the players, John O'Ross, was just going around trying to smash boys because I think he'd taken a bit of umbrage with how AJ McGinty was dealt with. Um, and the wheels came off Sale a little bit. Their discipline went. They they couldn't get a foot within the game. But credit to Irish. And if you're paying someone seven hundred fifty thousand quid a year to come off the bench. And Sean O'Brien, my God, you've got made a good sign in there. That's worth every every penny you're paying. He, surely he's not getting paid that. That's what I heard. My God, he came. <laughs> well, <laughs> even, my God. That, even, even for the try, uh, the last try, London Irish's last try, the yeah. simple skill, the simple yeah. skill of straightening the line and passing looks easier than it sounds and than it looks. We've been to Reading numerous times as players and working in the media when Irish have played there. And it's been soulless, hasn't it, Jim, if we're being honest. They, they tried their best to make an atmosphere there, but it wasn't that great. Now they're back in London at the Brentford Community Stadium, you know, where their roots are. People coming in there on the tube, having a load of beers. The atmosphere was unbelievable. I think that will help London Irish as well. And it certainly helped me come back and they got a bit of oomph uh, in that second half after AJ McGinty went off. And they deserved... The draw, and ultimately it's a three-point game, isn't it? Because they get the draw and the bonus point for four tries. So um, it was a hell of a Sunday game. You think Bath fans should be worried about their side losing at home to Newcastle? Great opening try for the Falcons as well, wasn't it, Jim? Rad one, one. man. <laughs> Rad one, man. Um, why are you asking me that question? Like, you know, he's been all positive about London Irish, and then I get to talk about how crap Bath are. Well, what I will I'm say, sure. actually... What I will say is someone came online on Twitter the other day and said, no doubt Goody and Jim will be negative about Bath again. Well, we can only go on what we see, can't we, Jim? Well, I'm only going on the scoreline and I've seen the highlights, so I, I, can't, I, I can't comment in depth without looking at players' work off the ball, you know, how much they want it. But Rad Rad Man, that is my favourite player uh, at the minute just because he's rapido. But as a Bath fan, I think you would be a bit worried. You think in week one, sail away, all right, you've lost. No real worries. And not been horrible to Newcastle, who were very good against Quinns in week one, albeit lost. You think in Newcastle, driving down in the Ford Galaxies, if they're still doing that, down to Bath. It's an easy one for Bath. And then you look at the halftime score, 20 points to three. To the Newcastle Falcons, my so old that's team, 17, Jim. 18, 19, 20. That's a 17-point deficit <laughs> at halftime, which is a lot. Which is a lot. So to be fair, they come back, obviously, in the second half. But in answer to the question, would you be worried? I mean, Newcastle, you know, 10 unanswered points in the second half, but they won the game. So I don't, we'll know this week, really. I mean, any, any team that loses three on the spin, I think that's when you start to worry. But it's two weeks in. The pre-seasons have seemed to be very different from what we're hearing. That they didn't go hard in pre-season. And a lot of teams are kind of, 
walking, jogging into the season. I know that sounds a stupid thing. There was a lot of rugby last season. There's a lot of rugby to be played this season. In answer to the person on social media that's coming at us, Andrew, ask me next week. We should say fair play to Newcastle, though, as well. Yeah, you know, yeah the, the, squad, well. The, squad, the squad that's been built as well. They've got some exciting players, obviously playing the 4G pitch up in Newcastle, which can be an absolute horror to go and play, especially in and around the winter. So a big shout out to them. They've got a, a real physical back five as well. Uh, Pitson, Robinson, Van der Valt, Will Welsh, and obviously a friend of the show, Carl Ferns as well. So Yeah, f- Ferns would have really, loved it. Yeah, and there's a real look of Dino, you know, a bit of old school. My mate Scott McLeod is there coaching the line out as well. Do you know what I mean? So it seems like they've got a real tough underbelly as well. So big shout out to Newcastle. Worcester fought back to make a pretty exciting final 10 minutes before going down by two points to Quinns, uh, didn't they? I just need to clear something up with you, Jim. Right. Uh, are you saying... I didn't say... No, I, no I'm no, i not saying. I didn't say... You did, it, you, did say, you did say if Worcester finish in the top six, you'd eat your Timberland boots, right? I it's think fine. what you meant what you meant really was if Worcester qualified for the Champions Cup, right? Should we, should we spread it to that, really? Oh, God. When's Ashy back? <laughs> well, because they're going to start losing. I them. need him back. I need him back ASAP. <laughs> Again, let me get to week three, and then we can we can set some boundaries. I can see when Ashy is going to get back. I'll text him. He might not reply now because we've said that he's leaving, but apparently he's not leaving because he's really really happy because Jonathan Thomas gave him a big hug. Apparently, um, <laughs> so I'll make a decision next week on my views on Worcester. I need to watch him more in depth. I, I feel horrible. You know, it's like, I, I, I was about to throw a horrible quote that I only watched the good teams. Now, that is horrible. And you're I'm horrible, if you, say that, you're, well, if you say that, you're disgusting. Mate, they, 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 they won one game last year and it was the well, first game of the season. So. No, but if you were watching the good teams, you'd have watched Harlequins because they're champions. That means you would have watched Harlequins against Yeah, but I don't like Worcester. Harlequins, so I don't watch them either. <laughs> <laughs> so that is actually the worst game ever at the weekend for me to watch, which I didn't watch. Yeah, well, I did. Um... And it was part of me was watching it, and Quinns went out, flew out the blocks. You know, it was the first time at home in front of their fans after winning the trophy. And, you know, there's a real feel good factor at um, the stoop. They were on fire to start off with. They built up a heavy lead against Worcester. And I'm, part of me is thinking, oh, it's the Worcester of old. You know, it's they're getting hosed again away from home. You know, they're all right at, at times at six ways on their 4G pitch to not out a few games when they need to. But this is different now, Jim. Um, you know, Quinns were very Quinns, flew out the blocks, you know, playing exceptionally well. Danny Kerr was unbelievable. Don Brandt as well, outstanding. Um, and they got themselves into a lead. But then they gave up a few tries and Worcester came right back into it. Deservedly got two points, two match points for the last play of the game. So they got the losing bonus point and four tries scored. So, yeah, it was Worcester. There's more bite about them this year. And I think a lot of it is being driven by Willie Hines and Owen Williams at nine and ten. Um, Matt Kvesic seems to have got a bit between his teeth again. He floated around a bit from Gloucester to Exeter and didn't really play. There was a lot expected of him. He's gone back to Worcester where he kind of earned his reputation of being a decent player. And now he's finally got the bit between his teeth because Ted Hill as well in the back row, who's in the England squad, was really good at the weekend um, at times. So yeah, listen, Ollie Lawrence scored a lovely try. He's a you know friend of the show and his dad likes us as well, doesn't he, Jim? So I'm hoping, desperately hoping, that Worcester end up finishing pretty much somewhere where they are now in the league, Jim, because right now, James, they're fourth. Yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just looking down at the league table now. It's, uh, You're going to be eating yeah. the Timberlands, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> good job I've had them for 10 years. Just soften them <laughs> up a bit. Do you guys want to have a go at Guess the Go At again this week? Yes. Oh. Go. Football. No. Rugby. Yes. Oh, God, I thought it was going to be boxing. I was going to go boxing third. Um, Richard McCaw? No. Scotland? No. England? No, yes. Okay, well, I'll get five more seconds now because you, you, you paused there. Owen Farrell? No. Oh, gosh, England. Johnny Wilson? No. Martin Johnson? No. Time's up, time's up. Lawrence Delalio? No. Oh God, Phil DeCampbell. <laughs> <laughs> Time is up, Jim. Oh, so you get one guess oh. so you know it's an England rugby player. 
England rugby. Well, you should have gone. Could you have gone into more detail than gone current England rugby player or past England rugby player? Yeah, but player? I, I, Andrew, you've been on the other side of the slipper. I it, know. Oh, it's it's going to be controversial. No, no, don't give him hints. I had in my mind that it was going to be boxing because of that shit show that we saw at the World. It was an unbelievable <laughs> boxing match. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It was unbelievable. But how bad was Anthony Joshua, though? Shocking. Genuinely, I don't want to throw it out there. I reckon I'd last three rounds with him. <laughs> 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 but it's awful. My goodness, um, mate. Do you reckon you'd last three rounds with AJ? I mean, to be fair, he didn't throw many punches. His really. last three rounds, yes. <laughs> he looked absolutely But he's on the road. England rugby England player. England rugby first. player. Oh. You get one guess. I mean, one guess. I'm going to be, I, 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 don't, I don't know how to say it. I'm going to say it. Andy Good. No. Oh, oh I thought, that's, I what thought, you that's what I thought, you get. I thought he was going to be arrogance. <laughs> I thought he was going to be funny and do a weird one. Never I never said it was an England rugby player. You said rugby, and then you said England. It was Sarah Cox. You are right. But where Jim went wrong, you didn't say male or female. If you'd have said no. female early on rugby, bang, I reckon you'd have got it. I'd have definitely got it. I, I tell, yeah. Well, I'm not happy about it. Not, I'm not, not happy because Sarah Cox was the first female premiership to take centre stage of a match as referee. I just, I, I wouldn't, I know, not being horrible, but I don't see her as an English rugby go at just yet. So we'll let the masses decide. Mm. Well, that's, but anyway. But that's, but that's where we need to define this game then, because it's called guess the go at. So if you're going in terms of go ats in rugby, my name would have to be in there somewhere. Why, well, Andrew, look, speaking frankly, and I think Sarah Cox would agree, I'm sure your name, <laughs> IMO, a lot of people <laughs> listening to this might disagree should be up there above Sarah Cox. Give her two or three more games and that could change. But she'll yeah. be very happy that you've done that, Andy Rowe. You've totally redeemed yourself. <laughs> there was a bit of international rugby going on at the weekend as well. Do you guys want to talk about the All Black Springboks game, the 100th test? All right, all right, Andy Rowe. You've won the rugby championship. Okay, we get it. You want to talk right about today. it. I mean, shit game, wasn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. It was just. I, I enjoyed it. Well, no, but it's South Africa, but playing the way South Africa play, box kick central, like they did against the Lions. I mean, it is a hard skill. I mean, Faf de Klerk gets the 22 line and someone screaming, kicks the ball. <laughs> Get it up there in the air. I mean, it is, it's, it's your, like, it's coming off your head. Like, that's all I know. So Luke Pierce messaged me after because I put a tweet out there. I didn't at Luke Pierce. I didn't want him to get any hate off any of our South African followers or any of my South African followers. He made a big call. He, he actually he refereed the game really well. But the way the game goes, and again, we're getting into the intricacies of it. So South Africa had a scrum around the halfway line. And yep. had an advantage at the scrum. Andre Pollard got the ball and kicked the ball. And off the kicked back the of that, as, as soon as he kicked the ball, Luke Pearce has said advantage over. It weren't advantage over. New Zealand have got the ball. South Africa have given away a penalty. And then, obviously, the Barrett brother, Geordie Barrett, has kicked from however far it was off that penalty. So, it wasn't an advantage over. I thought New Zealand were quite lucky with that. But anyway. And how did, Luke uh, Pierce, how did Luke Pierce correct you then, James? He didn't the correct minutes? me. He just called me out for calling him out. But I think he was frustrated because I didn't tag him. Maybe that was why. But he had a fantastic, <laughs> he had a wicked game. It was class to yeah. see him down there reffing. He was. Yeah. But these, these small intricacies. But South Africa... <laughs> Hey, if you want to keep kicking the balls, then that's what happens. You're going to dig your own grave. And the new United Rugby Championship got underway at the weekend. We've talked about your jacket already, but Leinster beat the Bulls. Are they still the team to beat in that competition? 100%. Um, firstly, we should say, Andrew, I don't know if you've seen it, but I've had to embed myself, immerse myself fully in the tournament. So I watched nearly all of the games of the URC at the weekend, as well as some Premiership Rugby. But Is that dressed was, as Spider-Man or not? No, it made Spider-Man. Um, it wasn't me. It was someone else. <laughs> Mate, the kids might listen to the podcast. I bloody hope they don't. Um, but the URC, the new format was brilliant. It really was. And the first game, Zebra Lions mentioned about it. Wasn't great. But from a South African perspective, it was. Uh, we're thinking, you know, can the Stormers, can the Bulls, um, can the Sharks compete? We didn't show that they could. Leinster... Head and shoulders above, I think, still. Munster looked good. Uh, Edinburgh looked good, to be fair, against the Scarlets. Glasgow were getting absolutely smoked 
in parts against Ulster, but nearly won that game as well. So, give it a bit of a snapshot. Cardiff beat Connacht away, and uh, Ospreys beat young. Newport. Yeah, Ospreys beat Newport Gwent Dragons. Poor Naz um, in the Newport Gwent Dragons Cup, Cup final in Newport <laughs> at the weekend. My point being, I'm trying to give you a snapshot of it. The format, as difficult as it still is to try and unpack. And pick. There seems to be a real energy around it, genuinely. So yeah. it was class to be a part of Premier Sports. My whole thing around summer rugby, which I'm tweeting about, and people are giving it loads about controversial kids, James, kids and people drowning in puddles. And basically, if the pitches are too hard, they're going to hit their head off the ground. People tweeting saying, "Well, we'll just water the pitches," and then people are saying, "What about the water? You're wasting water." I, I can't be done with it. But anyway, <laughs> if the weekend's rugby in the URC isn't a showcase for summer rugby, I don't know what is because the game that I was at, the big one, Edinburgh Scarlets, was awesome. All right, let's finish things off with the good, the bad and the ugly then. Yeah, absolutely loads of good this week. Uh, we just mentioned it then. We'll start off with the All Blacks uh, winning not only the 100th test against the Springboks, but winning the rugby championship as well at the weekend. So tip the slipper to them. And on that note, we also mentioned this young gentleman, Luke Pearce. I thought had an outstanding game uh, with the whistle. He could be the best referee in the world now. He's challenging Barnsley for me. Barnsley slowed get, down a bit. Yeah, he needs to work on his fitness, Barnsley. He's he's, yeah. he's, he's just sort of going out towards retirement now, isn't he? Comfort he? zone, so, isn't he? Like, yeah. He's just, yeah, he's got one eye on the future. He's got one eye on the afternoon speech. It's about the New Zealand-France story where he got pissed on the urinal. So yeah. anyway. <laughs> We've heard about that a few times. But yeah, hell of a performance from Luke Pearce with the whistle, even though Jim didn't think advantage was over. So he gets a mention in the good this week. Here's one for you, Jim. Getting a mention of the good this week, Eddie Jones. Because he's picked Rad one, man. Exactly. Uh, he listens to the pod. He's openly said it, apparently, in the press. Uh, and he's blooding fresh young meat into the squad. Um, great to see you know, some young faces in there, the likes of uh, Lewis Liner. Atkinson, I like his selection. Um, mm. Would have liked to have seen Dan Kelly as well in the squad because I thought he did quite well. And he's got a load of promise. But um, Atkinson's a real quality player. He deserves it as well. We mentioned her earlier, Sarah Cox, the first female Premiership rugby referee to take the whistle and lead a game as the referee. So um, a hell of a landmark for female referees around the world, actually. Um, and she's there. People, some people have said, "Oh, it's you know, it's just good. no, no." She's there on merit. She's a very good referee, um, and she's done exceptionally well to come through, done all the levels, championship and below, and now she's handling the Premiership. So uh, big tip of the slipper to Sarah Cox. Uh, we'll go over to France. Toulouse beat Clermont to go four from four in the top 14. The only unbeaten team in the top 14 now. Um, a hell of a feat for them. Back-to-back champions last year winning the Champions Cup and the top 14. So they've started this season in fine fettle as well. Didn't um, see it. Didn't see it, Jim? No. Well, a lot of people saw this one. Edinburgh in their home stadium. Mainly, oh, they, always. mainly they saw it because of your shit jacket, but I might come on to that later. Uh, great to see Edinburgh. They're going to get mentioned the good this week. Great to see Edinburgh in their new stadium uh, at home. And they started with a hell of a win over the Scarlets as well. So uh, well done. Hashtag always. Ben Bellicott carved up. Ex-Wasp, mate. What do you expect? No doubt. Yeah. Sticking in the United Rugby Championship, Simon Zebo back in the Munster Red, scored yeah. two tries on his Munster return and gave his boots to a young fan as well. So, um, Tip of the slipper to Simon Zebo. Uh, Benetton beating the Stormers. Big victory, that is. Um, they were really poor last year in the Pro 14. They won the Rainbow Cup, separate competition. So they've carried on their good form and they got a victory first up against the Stormers. So well done to Benetton. And then we'll go to the Premiership, James. We'll start off with Saints. Decent win down at the Chiefs. I thought Dingwall, Proctor, Furbank and Grayson were all outstanding. Um, so some good noises around the Northampton Saints boys at the minute. London Irish is second half. They're definitely going to get a shout out in the good this week. Um, hell of a comeback. 17 points down. Um, Shawnee O'Brien was monumental in getting them the draw towards the death. Uh, and then it's all about my old clubs, James. And which way do you want to go with this? Well, I know where you're going to go. Who paid yeah, the we'll most st- money? We'll start-, <laughs> <laughs> we'll start off with the Falcons. Oh, OK. Uh, well, actually, they might have... I'm trying to think about it over the years. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. The Falcons, the lowest paid. Well, in terms of... No, no, in terms of time. Not oh, time. No, 
not, not, pay, per, not, pay, not pay per minute, yeah. Not pay per minute, because Falcons would win that, I reckon. Anyway, uh, Falcons won 20 points to 13 down at Bath. Uh, Adam Rudd won, man. Was silly good again with his finish. Uh, a great victory for the Falcons boys. Uh, then we'll go to Leicester Tigers. Top of the table. A great win down at Gloucester. They're back to the glory days of when you and I were there, Jim. Top of the table without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, so a good start from them, two from two. But the good this week, James, can only go to one place, my young friend. The Mighty Wasps. I thought you were going to say Ospreys three. then. Sorry, no, okay. yeah, cool. <laughs> I definitely wasn't going to say the Ospreys. The Mighty Wasps, a 44 points to eight dismantling of Bristol's uh, defence was on point. Big tip of the slipper to Matty Everard as defensive coach. So, um, yeah, the feel-good factor is back at Wasps. So they get the good this week. Uh, the bad, few bits of bad. Um, we mentioned them a few times. Bath, uh, they looked all over the shop at times defensively and pretty confused in attack as well. So they get mentioned in the bad. They need Stuart Hooper to get his rousing speech out of his back pocket and just present some jerseys again because I'm sure they'll fire themselves back up the league if they do a few rousing speeches. Jim, maybe you can go down there and give one. Yeah, I don't know whether I'll be welcomed with open arms after my Gloucester speech in the change room saying, that's fucking Bristol in there. That's what I could do actually this weekend. Maybe Actually, there you go. rewind. I could, be, I, could be, I could be in Bath. I could be in Bath this week, lads. <laughs> um, what else is bad? Sanzar. This is really bad, I think. Really bad. I, see, I, I disagree because the bloke you're going to talk about is a word that I would never say in public. <laughs> but go on. Well, well, three times they... Um, tried to organise this photo shoot with all the captains. Uh, from what I hear, one time New Zealand couldn't do it. Another time South Africa couldn't do it. And the third time they went to do it, New Zealand could make it, Australia could make it, and South Africa could make it, but the Argentinians didn't. And they thought, fuck them, we'll go with it anyway, we'll take the picture. <laughs> <laughs> the Argentinians don't really matter, so they, they ain't winning anything. So they weren't invited to the picture and it looked pretty bad it was a rugby championship with just three captains not even four and mario ledesma i mean what a bloke he is i mean he's, he's just not gone. this is the thing this is <laughs> this is why because i love argentina goody yeah. i love the argentinian players the people the country but the fact that he was fronting it saying it's not on like it's disrespectful mate it's a story for another day do not talk to me about disrespect speaking to people like dogs is all i know maybe yeah I don't know. Anyway, there we go. There we go. Anyway, so it's not good from Sanzar, but they're not getting the bad because Jim ain't up there because he doesn't like the Desmond. That's another story, isn't it, James? Um, What else is bad? Claremont in the top 14. They've now played four and lost three and they're second bottom. Um, So not a good start to the season. With John Gibbs at the helm. Well, who are you blaming? Put me name to it. I've not seen any of it, so it'd be a bit harsh, but yeah, just put me name well, um, to it. They, yeah, the only game they did win, uh, they won the last one that kicked from Cami Lopez. So they're second bottom of the top 14, not a great start for them. But the bad this week, can only go to one place, James? Poe. Okay. No. No, not Poe. No. no. Um, I'm going to just hit you with it, Jim. It's going to Jim Hamilton and his shit coat. Yeah, but it was well, literally the worst bit of clobber I've ever seen. Who wears a red suede jacket to a rookie game like that? Honestly. Butlins were calling. If, all if sorts you got of, paid if, fifty grand off Bell, Bell staff for doing that, would you wear it then? Hundred percent, I'd wear it. But you weren't getting paid fifty grand. <laughs> <laughs> I was paying them <laughs> anyway. It's a talking point. I can't think whether Bell staff will be absolutely raging at this marketing or bloody loving it. We will yeah. see. Sale, if sales are flying up through the roof, then we know the answer. Yeah, any press is good press, eh, Jim? Um, so the bad this week goes to Jim's jacket. An absolute shocking bit of clubber. So get rid of it. Um, the ugly, only one bit of ugly really uh, throughout the weekend, and it was Paul, Allo, Emil, uh, the prop, the stuff on say shoulder charge um, in the ta- in the shoulder charge in the tackle. Uh, got a red card in about the third minute actually for South say against Cast. Didn't matter though because they went on to win by thirty points. So um, there's the ugly. Paul, Allo, Emil for his shoulder charge tackle, straight red card. Three minutes into the game, can you imagine the dirt tracking you have to do afterwards? The fitness session because you've been sent off after three minutes. He'd be raging. Thanks, Goody. And you've got a shout out to finish off with, don't you? Yeah, a massive shout out to 11 year old Toby Fletcher, um, who we should all spare a thought for after the weekend. Uh, he's committed to run one kilometre for every point that Bristol Bears concede this season. So he's got to do 44 kilometres, thanks to Wasps, because we absolutely pulled our pants down. Uh, but he's doing it for an amazing cause um, in St. Peter's Hospice uh, down in Bristol, which looked after his grandma, June. So 
well before she sadly lost her battle with cancer last year. Uh, and he's calling it the Bearathon because he's a Bristol Bear fan. Did you get it, Jim? Yeah, with the Athon being the Marathon. There we go. Uh, so he needs all the help you can get at the moment. Um, check out his Just Giving page, um, which is justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash Claire dash Fletcher 22. Um, so massive shout out uh, to Toby. Uh, hell of an effort, mate. And sorry that Wasp put 44 points on you. So you have to make a, a big old run to match the kilometres. Good on you, Toby. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, producer Tristan. And thank you very much for listening. And if you're looking for something else to listen to after this, check out my latest episode of The Andy Rowe Show with former undercover cop who infiltrated the infamous Millwall hooligan firm. His story is absolutely crazy. So search for The Andy Rowe Show wherever you get your podcasts. Rugby spot. Spot a pod, 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 pod.